need to fill in on Friday. Um, and actually I did because I've just written a request for historic designation for a ranch just outside of Hayden. Mm -hmm. And the process of learning about that ranch and what made it special, I'll tell you my curiosity began when I was reading my mother's letters from college. So she's writing to my grandfather, who was Ferry Carpenter, who had the ranch, you know, just east of Hayden. And there are all these worried things. What's happening to Coke? And I was like, what? And, you know, is he going to be able to keep the place? And my grandfather was a lawyer. I knew that. So I assume maybe he was representing Coke. But I didn't know. There was just worry, worry, worry. Repeatedly from Stanford University. She's writing to Colorado, worrying about a neighbor. So I told the current owners of the ranch this. I said, do you have any idea what was going on in the 40s? They looked at me just blank. I, that was before our time. We don't know anything about that. So that is what inspired me to kind of look into this whole subject. And the more I learned, the more interested I got. So that's why I, when Katie called uh, for the sub, I was like, yeah, let me talk about Coke Roberts. Um, so it's Roberts with a D, um, very interesting individual, uh, and he started in Texas. We're gonna we're gonna wind our way here to why this slide is on the thing, but I'm gonna start off first with a little bit about this person. So this man started was born in Texas along the Brazos River, like many people, um, his and with a large family. His father decided to go into gold mining. Like if you have a bunch of kids to support, that would not seem like the most steady form of income. But anyway, <laughs> they moved to uh, Trinidad and to the river northeast of Trinidad. And he, Coke always carried with him this aura of being a Texan, but he was actually nine years old when he moved to Colorado. So. Colorado gets to claim him, but he had a Texas style about him. Uh, and he went back to Texas as a young adult and gathered up some horses that are now known as the Steel Dust Mares. And they were, obviously, Steel Dust has got to be gritty and tough. Um, they were very strong, uh, very good uh, or he saw in them very good ranch, potential ranch horses. And then he brought them to Oklahoma, and he didn't like Oklahoma, and he married a woman named Belula, and she didn't like Oklahoma. So lo and behold, they moved to Northwest Colorado to the Ampa Valley. And his friend, and I'm not sure how this connection was made, but those of you who know some local history recognize the name of Cy Dawson. So Cy Dawson was J.B. Dawson's uh, son, and they f kind of put together what is now the Carpenter Ranch. It was a whole bunch of small homesteads, and they actually literally put it together by dragging log homes, eight, five, the numbers change depending on who's look, but, and kind of connected them into this house now that has a lot of different roofs going in a lot of different directions. And of course, this winter had a lot of problems with snow and water and ice mm -hmm. and so on. But it's this beautiful old ranch house. So Cy da Dawson was the son who helped his father put that ranch together. And then he was, like many young people at the time, fascinated with racehorses and horses in general. And he somehow knew Coke Roberts. They knew each other. And this adventure starts when the two of them went over to Denver and saw a horse race in a quarter mile, half mile actually race, and just win it clean. And Cy Dawson, having money, said, let's go buy that horse. And Coke said, why don't we get the stallion of that horse? And they thought, well, maybe it's kind of old, but then it would be less expensive. So Cy Dawson took off, went all over the place chasing down this horse and came back with a horse named Peter McHugh. And that was the beginning uh, of this American Quarter Horse did not exist. Wasn't even a word. Um, the association, the registry, the whole deal, American Quarter Horses didn't exist until the 40s. 
But so Cope and Roberts and Cy Dawson, and then Cy Dawson promptly said, I'm going to Brazil to make my fortune and took off with Cope's, uh, Emmett, Cope's brother and went to this gigantic cattle ranch in Brazil and promptly died. And his wife then brought Peter McHugh over and said, Peter McHugh is yours. You know, I don't want to deal with Peter McHugh. I don't, I don't like horses anyway. So <laughs> at that point, uh, the other thread of this story is that, and, and this is where I kind of start to think that Coke Roberts had some sort of, as my granddaughter would say, superpowers. Because he went down um, to get his stuff that came in on the railroad bond, and in doing so, went through Yampa and saw a freighter, you know, a wagon with horses pulling it. Saw a horse in that cluster of, well, I don't even know how many it was. It was a Palomino. And he said to the owner of this, I'm going to buy that horse. And the guy said, well, I need to get where I'm going first. You know, I've got this load. And he said, okay, I'll go down to Bond. I'll get my stuff. I'll come back up, but I'll pay you for that Palomino horse. So that's old Fred. And old Fred became nearly as famous as Peter McHugh. And what he did, um, th this is backing up a little bit. Uh, so this is where I'll tell you why that slide was up there. Um, I'll get it back. Oh. Um, you know, I, I've been kind of interested in this whole idea of domestication and in our relationship to other species, which, you know, now we're kind of cats and dogs people mostly, but, you know, a hundred years ago, this was, this area was intensely involved in livestock, right? You were either a sheep person, a cattle person, some people were horse people, not very many people had goats, whoops. Don't join Wi-Fi. You'll be okay without Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of a chart that shows domestication. Pretty fascinating. You know, we know dogs, right, 15,000 years ago to 36,000 years ago. They don't really know. And then, you know, sheep 11,000 years ago, goats, cows, pigs, etc. And horses, you know, were somewhere in here like 5,000 years ago, 5,500 years ago, according to this. But this whole process of agriculture and cultivation depends on domesticating animals, right? I mean, first you domesticate grains because people were selecting different types of grasses and then planting those grasses like wheat and oats and so forth, and then you're domesticating animals. And how did that happen? Well, apparently it happened in many different ways. Um, it isn't just one simple process. I mean, dogs, obviously, um, or maybe not dog, not obviously, but uh, they, okay, types, of, sorry, I'm not a PowerPoint person, so I'm doing my best here. So there are three ways that animals get domesticated, which I think is really interesting to think about people, right? And how is it that we build connections with animals and animals with us? And obviously we're dealing with that with bears, right? Bears are getting a little over domesticated in steamboat. <laughs> They've learned how to open up Subarus and walk into kitchens and right behind your belt. open up refrigerators and, you know, that's a an unfortunate form of domestication where they become dependent. <laughs> so the main way is that they were originally prey. So sheep, goat, cattle, um, rats, mice, ducks, pigeons, turkeys were animals that uh, humans hunted. And then at some point they decided to not only hunt them but capture them and then keep them in case they needed them through the winter, right? So they're prey. The other very common way, and dogs, cats, chickens, llamas, alpaca, yak, I don't know if you can read this. They're called commensuals, which I would call mutual. It's like mutual aid. So a dog adopts a person for the food and the scraps that come you know, off the campfire. And the human adopts the dog because dogs are wonderful at protecting people. They bark, they growl, they so forth. So that, that's called a commensual relationship. Cats, it's a little 
hard to know. I mean, cats, <laughs> you know, can wander off, but they, cats became domesticated when they're storing grain. So if you have grain that's stored, you know, you've got rats, you've got mice, you've got everything else. So cultivating the cat through the winter time so that then they would take care of the mice and so on is a commensual type of thing. Um, and obviously chickens, you know, it's really interesting to think of chickens as domesticated. I don't really think of chickens as very domesticated, but the definition now is these, there's a whole lot of people interested in this process of domestication because human beings and culture and agriculture couldn't really have moved forward in the same way along with all the nutrition that came with domestication unless they were able to have this particular relationship with animals. So chickens, um, you know, it's like they're wild birds but they lay eggs so what is it that makes the turn between a wild animal and a, and a not a wild animal? And the best I can understand, it's about fear. If an animal is, stops being afraid of humans, they're domesticated. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so it's sort of like tame, but it's not like, oh, kitty kitty type of tame. It's more that they don't run away and hide and scream out of town when a human being comes around. They get accustomed to humans. So the middle one they call directed, it, it's also <coughs> sort of predatory, but it was uh, horses, donkeys, camels, buffaloes, rabbits, hamsters, ostrich, and parrot. You know, it's like weird combinations of animals with different genetics that react differently to humans. So these were animals that people captured and then they gradually sort of got used to people but there are also animals that if you let them go, they're gone. Like a, you know, a horse, well, of course a cat can go feral, or kittens can go feral, but horses very easily can wander off and obviously we've got wild horse problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because horses can quickly become wild again. And then can you re-domesticate them? You know, my neighbor, her, I don't know what he is, like a great nephew or something, just adopted a wild horse colt from Craig and has been working with that colt that had never been around people. And now the colt, you'd think, was just a regular domestic horse. There's something about it that in the last three weeks and the presents and the food and the treats and who knows what, that horse is no longer a wild horse. But if you drove it out to Utah and dropped it off, it could probably mm -hmm. become a wild horse again. So different animals have different changes. So I just bring this up because breeding animals and raising livestock was just like, it was more than the ski industry. It was a crucial part of the economy here. Like almost everyone had a relationship with a domesticated animal, a milk cow, a chicken, a horse, right? And and we don't live in that world anymore. I mean, uh, at least I don't. I mean, I've got a dog, and he's pretty domesticated, but I'm not depending on my dog for food or milk or my livelihood. He's just, you know, happy little sparky dog. That's all he <laughs> is. Um, and I think most of us have lost that connection to that domestication process or the dependence on animals and their dependence on us. You know, that really quite, at best, symbiotic type of relationship. So, back to Coke. Nobody was breeding animals until about this, in the 1700s. So you got Darwin and Mendel, you know, geneticists. And they started thinking that, they were fascinated with the idea of domestication, like silkworms and sheep for wool and other things that were commodities, right? And how is it that we train animals essentially to serve us, right? Or, and to be comfortable in proximity to people and depend on humans. They were, they were fascinated with that whole thing and what was happening to them genetically because like animals like horses just change dramatically fast in the presence of human beings but they weren't deliberately breeding them. But that's when breeding started. And it was very 
sort of science oriented. You had to keep a lot of records because obviously if you breed the wrong animals together, you end up with giant mistakes. Um, I saw some animals out at the Franktown Rescue, the Dumb Friends League, a whole bunch of Tennessee Walker horses mm -hmm. that had been inbred mm -hmm. and, you know, their backs they had these huge mm -hmm. swell backs and they had terrible feet and they, some of them seemed oh. to be kind of wandering around and, you know, they didn't know if they were adoptable, except maybe they do have a sort of pasture ornament category where if you don't want to ride the horse, you can still have a horse that from a distance will look kind of nice on your property. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, <laughs> they are called pasture pets and they rank, they rank some animals like that. But that was an example of really bad breeding, you know, really big mistakes can be made. So it took a lot of study and thinking and in the way of Coke Roberts, it took a really good kind of intuitive sense of a stallion and a mare and what's going to come from it. So like now we would have an end point, you know, we're trying to get the perfect corgi with the perfect amount of white ears. And my grandfather used to make all kinds of fun of this stuff, like 4-H, he hated 4-H because they were counting the number of white hairs on the Herefords back, you know, and that was part of the criteria. And he was like, we're, eat, we're raising these things for meat. And, that's, and so he was, oh, he bred bulls and he got into meat and carcass evaluation. And when I was asked when I was applying for a job at the Extension Service about my experience in 4-H, I was like, I'm sorry, I wasn't allowed to be in 4-H. <laughs> sort of, you know, not a thing to do. And I brought up the white hairs on the back of the uh, Hereford. But so someone like Coke, he didn't have a breed. Like my grandfather was breeding Herefords and he knew what he was trying to get to. But Coke, this is, you know, when, when did he come to Route County? 1918, he's, and he's breeding horses. I, I know he wanted them to be fast. And at that point, Peter McHugh and his descendants were running a quarter mile in 21 seconds. And that's pretty dang fast. That's 55 miles an hour. So I looked up what's the current record for a quarter horse running a quarter mile. And it's 20.68 20 sec 20 seconds. So they, it hasn't gotten a whole lot faster since those descendants of Peter McHugh and old Fred. Uh, so he was mainly at the beginning oriented towards speed. But what makes a horse fast? I, you know, you tell me. I mean, they're just, you get one fast one and you breed it to another fast one. I don't know. <laughs> but he was, he was also looking for really good ranch horses because that was the market right around here. Nobody had a car. I mean, and they needed horses for transportation, they needed them to gather cattle, they needed them to pull plows. Um, horses were, it's like, horses were in some ways status like a car. You know, if somebody makes a lot of money and they go out and buy, let's just say a BMW, you know, and they flash it around town. Well, in this case, if you had a nice looking horse, that was the status like a car. I think that's the easiest mm -hmm. thing. And you could get from here to Hayden or wherever you wanted to go pretty darn fast on a quarter horse, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to a workhorse, you know, which just basically needs big feet mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and a very heavily muscled body. So these horses that he was breeding, some of them almost look like, war uh, I'll show you some pictures of some of these horses. Um, you know, and you may, you may get sick of horses, but um, I think they're kind of fascinating animals and how they came to be the way they are. Anyway, he wasn't aiming toward a particular thing, and I think that's, um, think about yeah, see ya. So this is Coke Roberts, um, you know, not the, the, the classic Route County portrait where the hat is pulled down <laughs> so low that you can't really see any facial features. I mean, you, you can see he's pretty skinny mm -hmm. and uh, fairly short, 
And I don't, Jay, do you have any idea what he's sitting on? It's some kind of. Looks like a scraper. Yeah. That was pulled behind those workhorses. Right. To move dirt. Yeah. Yeah. To pull behind horses, and you know, and they used what became quarter horses as workhorses. That the these were not like, you know, so precious and getting shampooed every day or anything. <laughs> these were horses that had to earn their keep essentially. So even though he's breeding horses and selling horses, that a saddle horse had to be really versatile. Had to be able to pull a wagon. I might have to be able to pull this, pull a plow. People used horses all the time. And I, one thing I learned about horses talking to kids that went up to the Elkhead schoolhouse was that being able to use a horse to get to school was like, you know, amazing privilege. And it only was the richer people that could share their horse with their kids to let them go the two, three miles, whatever. And then they would stop at other kids' houses and they'd all pile on to the horse <laughs> until, you know, they all got up to school together. But horses were mainly work animals. Right? They weren't recreational uh, animals. This is at what is now the Flanders Ranch. Uh, that old barn is still, is still there. Right? I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint where I just click. I'm just taking you um, pictures one by one. So this is Peter McHugh um, before he came to Colorado. Um, boy, I'm sorry, this is not a great picture. But this is kind of classic of what became the quarter horse with a pretty high back end, pretty thick neck, right? Pretty heavy across the shoulders. Um, but I don't know if I would have looked at that horse and said that was like the fastest horse that had ever run a quarter mile. I don't, I mean, I don't, he did though. So I'll show you um, old Fred. And if anybody knows oh, who this wow. this guy is, yeah. So this is the horse that he bought off the Yampa freight, freighter, and this Palomino. It was obviously a pretty dark Palomino, but you can see the light mane and tail. All Palominos pretty much are related to Old Fred now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it, this That's he wild. became the Palomino horse. So back to breeding. I mean, not that this is the most fascinating subject, but it's like, so why did this guy? Okay, I'll, I'll give you, I need to tell you a fact. There are 5.3 million registered quarter horses in the United States. Of those, 5.1 are related to Peter McHugh. Oh, that's wow. awesome. <laughs> so really, Hayden, West Route, Route County, is the foundation of the American Quarter Horse. That's where they all came from. So both of these horses ended up in the Quarter Horse Hall of Fame uh, because they are called foundation studs. They didn't know it at the time. They didn't know it until they were, nobody knew it until they were dead a long time. Both Peter McHugh and old Fred had died. Pretty much Coke had already died. I mean, he had 15 years of knowing that he was an important breeder of the American Quarter Horse. But the American Quarter Horse didn't kind of develop through the 40s, and then, and it developed starting with these two horses. So his brilliance in breeding was to take a mare from Old Fred against Peter McHugh, and a mare from Peter McHugh against Old Fred, right? And then just keep mingling these along with the steel dust mares. And over the course of many decades, he developed these really versatile and fast and wonderful saddle horses and cattle horses and in their case, plow horses and so forth. We're kind of crazy. I mean, someone yeah, would devote yeah. their life to this, but, and he didn't even know what he was trying to get to. He, yeah, just, didn't. he just did it. Um, he just loved horses. And he wanted something that was, um, so this is maybe a little hard to see, but um, this is Peter McHugh and all his descendants. This is old Fred connecting with various descendants. And this is basically the American Quarter Horse Diaspora, I guess you'd call it, you know, where, where the genetic map of American Quarter Horses. 
So it's pretty, when, when I say 5.1 million, these, these are the foundation studs, they're called, the old Fred, Peter McHugh, Traveler, you can read. They're people who write about this stuff like it was their grandma. You know, I mean, they go on and on. Uh, whole biographies of these various horses. Um, and who had them and when and all of that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you, these are the steel dust mares and it, it, you know, they don't look all that fancy and special. Um, you know, they're out there, you know, you can tell they're along the Yampa River um, with some guy that I don't know who that is. Hope somebody someday can tell us who was holding them. It could have been John Kitchens. And those mares came from Texas? Those came from Texas and Oklahoma. And they were famous there, but they weren't that common in Colorado. So this was the other, I always like it when the mares get a little attention because so. everything <laughs> seems to go by the stallions, right? But stallions, you know, can have an awful lot of offspring and mares maybe don't have as many offspring. Um, and so, you know, you get this influence thing. But anyway, those are the steel dust mares. So all, uh, every story has, in my mind, every good story has some tragedy to it. Uh, you know, there's, there's this theory about stories that probably some of you have heard that, you know, there's the ascending story, there's the descending story, and then there's the oscillating story. And the oscillating stories are the best ones to, to tell. They're the best ones for young people to know. So when you're telling them about your own life or they're going through some tragedy of their own, they've lost a child, they've gotten divorced, some important person has died, their house has been foreclosed on. That's the time when we need to be telling stories to young people. And the best stories to tell them are the oscillating ones. They're the ones that, yeah, we used to have a beautiful ranch and then we lost it and we ended up, you know, in this trailer park and then we've been pulling ourselves back together and so-and-so got to go to college, you know? It's the, or we thought we were in high rolling here and we had, you know, first water rights and we had the BMW and we had all this good stuff and then this happened and this happened and this happened and we got knocked down but we, and, and we struggled back up. To share those struggles is really, really important, I think. And too often we're protecting our own reputations and our own sense of our own importance, I guess. And we're talking about how wonderful we are and how much we've done in our lives. And we forget to share with our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, kids that we run into, like, wow, I tripped and I fell hard, you know, when this happened. This divorce knocked me flat on my face, right? Or when my grandmother died, I was lost. It's just, it's important to share that. And I know I talk about vulnerability and I always think of little ladies coming around on high heels and being vulnerable. <laughs> I never liked that word, but I think it's part of sharing the true stories of things. So what happened to Coke um, is, is very interesting and it happened to a lot of people in the Ampa Valley and in the hills above the valley. Um, after World War II, uh, the government encouraged people to borrow money. It was just universal. And mortgages became common and borrowing money became common. And improving your herd, improving your land, adding more cropland, you know, they had a shortage of food in Europe. People were urged to, to borrow money and expand, right? And uh, you know that wonderful phrase, be a booster, not a knocker. Right? It was kind of like enforced optimism. <laughs> kind of, like, you must try harder and build bigger and do more. And certainly it affected the Fulton family. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly affected my family. People borrowed money, went into debt, and then, you know, of course, after a war, prices of agricultural products typically go down. So Coke, in this case, had borrowed um, 
I think it was $6,000. And at that time, people, individuals took on notes. So wealthy people basically acted like a bank and they set their own interests. Things were not very well regulated. They set their own terms. So some guy named William Weber or something, not from here, loaned Coke $6,000. Again, not against his valley land, against his sagebrush land, his grazing land up above. But this guy promptly sold the note to somebody, and then they promptly sold it to Maroney Smith. And I don't know if you know the Smith family here, but they're, they were a Mormon family. They are a Mormon family that, or some of them are pretty lapsed. And they wouldn't mind me saying that, but... Um, they came from the Salt Lake City area. I, I'm pr they wouldn't say this, but mm -hmm. I would guess that as the church often does, and with, and this is a tradition among many uh, congregations where the young people are given money to go settle in a new place, like Mennonites. You know, we have a big Mennonite population out of Craig. They're funded by the Mennonite church. They're, you know, they buy land and they send people out well, the Mormons did this all the time. They, you know, running out of space, running out of water, you set, give money and you send people out to sort of start something somewhere. So Maroney Smith, and you can tell by that name, was probably a descendant of, you know, the original John Smith, which he had, there were probably a zillion of them, but anyway. Um, but Maroney meaning, you know, the angel Maroney. And he rolled into Route County in the 30s and he bought a lot of land and he had a lot of money. He bought the note that Coke had and Coke could not pay it and he took him to foreclosure, you know, took him to district court here in Steamboat and it turned out that Coke had wisely not taken down that valley land, you know, irrigatable land. He had mortgaged his land up above the ranch, up in the sagebrush, uh, up the California Park Road. Just sagebrush, sagebrush, and some oak brush, and some more sagebrush. But Maroney quickly figured out that in order to pay the note, which he had now calculated to be worth $28,000, um, he needed to take the valley land, and that's where it went to court, because apparently Coke and I don't know if this was a little bit Texas style or what, had sort of waved his hand up to the north and said, I own that whole section. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't. He only owned it half of the section. So when the judge here in Steamboat was looking over this mess, you know, total mess, he said, oh my gosh, you lied about owning this whole section and you obviously don't own it. So I'm foreclosing on your whole place and Rooney Smith gets the title and you're out of here. So that was a pretty big, there's a lot of articles in the newspaper detailing this loss. And here's somebody who had enormous stature and his horses had stature and he and his horses probably had the most stature and his wife was, you know, well loved and all of that and they had no kids and they poured themselves into starting this ranch and keeping this ranch. So I don't know if there were like social pressures on Moroni or what happened, but my grandfather was Coke Robert's lawyer. So I'm getting back to my mother's letters. So my grandfather, Ferry Carpenter, was Coke's lawyer. And I think got hit broadside by this fraudulent claim of owning this land. And then he lost in district court in Steve. And I think he was shocked and of course Maroney had hired the best lawyers like a whole team of them in Denver and they're up against grandpa which who was perfectly capable lawyer but like not up to anyway they appealed it to the Supreme Court and that's where the story goes like dry it's like then what happened then what happened and I asked everybody including poor Katie here at the Colorado, this. Colorado Supreme Court. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 They sure. appealed from but district <coughs> right. court in Steamboat to the Colorado um, Supreme Court, <coughs> and hoping to basically. Well, all I could tell was that my grandfather was trying to stall, because you had a whole ranching operation, 
80 horses, you know, a whole deal, and just to wipe him out and let this sheep man, right, Bernie oh, Smith, sheep. they were all <laughs> sheep, 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 triple sheep, sheep, sheep. And then he pulled a fast one and gave it to his son, Leland, and then that got reversed, and there's like so many tangled things. I was like, what in the world happened? <coughs> Finally, I went to the current owner of this ranch, who's um, the Flanders, Mary Beth Flanders Steffens, and I said, Mary Beth, I am stuck, you know, I mean, I know this isn't crucial to the historic application, but I'd really like to know, you know? Like, how did you end up with the ranch? Like, how come it's not the Smiths? They own everything. They own 60,000 acres in Route County. Oh how come they didn't gobble up this little acre? Today, they own. Today. Okay. They are big, big, big sheep people. Okay. They're all the way around my place. They, okay. They're everywhere. And they're, well, anyway. <laughs> Two brothers, John and Brad, um, they, they're still here. So, you know, there's another way of offending people, but um, I'm sort of fearless in that regard. And we're, we've been friends since we were kids, so I won't say anything terrible about them. Um, so how is it that, you know, this ended up? And Mary Beth says, I don't know, but I've got this uh, abstract of the title that's like this thick, but it's up in Laramie, and I'll go get it, and you can go through it. Well, I went through this thing, and I get, and of course, every encumbrance on the property is listed there. Well, somebody got fascinated with this whole court case, and they wrote everything. They wrote the entire trial is in there. Everything, it's like Zimmerman abstract. I don't know if any of you connected with them in Steamboat, but. Somebody went completely bananas and wrote like a hundred pages about this court case in the title, the, you know, the title search, right? So what ended up happening was the judge was like, so then by then it, it gotten up to maybe $36,000, I think. It was just, you know, every year, they compound interest and fees and whatnot. It was worth more than, the, the note was worth more than the whole ranch. Uh, beyond, beyond. And so somehow somebody said, you know, Maroney, I think you need to knock it down a little bit, like maybe three times the original price. So the bill went down to $18,000. And then somehow Coke was able to go to Omaha or somewhere and borrow money. And whether he, again, waved his arm and said, I own all of that up there, <laughs> I don't really know. But he was able to borrow the 18000 and pay off that note. Whereupon his wife died. Whereupon he married the welfare off officer of, because I think he was down to nothing. And then he decided he was just, he was old by then. He was in his 80s. He had survived this. He had this wonderful herd of horses and he put it all up for sale and hmm. left. And he didn't leave the country. He moved to Hayden to a small, Nice little house <laughs> where everything was normal. Um, so that was the story. And, you know, he had no descendants, and he had led a long life, and he died when he was 90 and on a trip. Um, so here's an ad um, oh, I love it. from Coke. Yeah, I breed him, you buy him, ride him, race him, show him. Just like <laughs> right, and that those are the corrals that are still there at the Flanders Ranch. I thought you'd like that. I found that in the local newspaper, <laughs> and um, and then just one lasting legacy of Coke Roberts. I don't know if any of you go to the Route County Fair, but he's the one who designed the racetrack. And so, George Watts. I don't know if any of you know, but his family. He had like not 17 children, but almost, <laughs> and they all sang, and, they, and he was a poet, and he wrote a lot of songs. So this is the poem that he made, if you can see, to, this is now on the Route County um, Fair website, so it, it kind of winds around a little bit, but yeah, I thought it was cool that he knew Coke, and he knew that he had designed this race track that's now still in Hayden the original uh, oh. quarter mile racetrack. It is. Yes, oh. yes, that's exactly, and the stands, well, if you're, you'd have to take the picture, but basically that's, he designed that racetrack to show off his mm. horses. So.
any interesting yeah wow, that's great <laughs> really great <laughs> all kinds of crazy oh things my gosh. and yeah, uh, just fascinating. You know, some people have you you know it when you see them, or you feel it when you're around them. They just have a way with animals. You know that mm -hmm. that's kind of a phrase here. Someone has a way with animals, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that Coke had. He also had some Texas swagger, and obviously knew how to write an advertisement, <laughs> right, that mm -hmm. would catch people's eyes, um, and how to sell horses. So. You know, just another little piece of Route County's history here. But awesome. So any questions or thoughts about this? Yeah. Bell, um, our neighbor, Clinton Simmerton. Oh, yeah. Had, yeah. Was an amazing quarter horse breeder. And his yeah. all came from Peter McHugh and yeah. Mary McHugh. Yeah, his, his famous stallion was Starduster. Right. Was that? They all really came from here. Yeah, okay. And that's the, when I begged Katie, the Adams, the curator here, I said, have you got anything on Coke? Because I'm running dry here. You know, this is a guy that was born in 1870. He exactly wasn't on the internet, you know? <laughs> um, it's hard to find stuff on one single person, especially they didn't have any children to say anything about them, find stuff in the census. But she gave me an interview between Evelyn Simitan and Coke. And it's just kind of incredible because the two of them are sitting there and it's kind of like old people talking about their grandchildren except it's all horses <laughs> every single thing so mary McHugh, now she she was the mo she was the dam for da 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 and then no no that was the other one over there that was da da da, -da. <laughs> well who did you sell that one to well that one was da -da 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 -da. you know, just <laughs> oh my god it's like genealogy day but horses you know <laughs> wow so but Evelyn's, all of their horses, as well as the Lighthizers, the Peavies, yeah. uh, they all came out of uh, Old Fred and Peter McHugh. Mm -hmm. and, they, and then there were many more names, you know, Mary McHugh, and then there were Peter McHugh too, and you know, people tried to trade off of that, and then the Steel Dust names got blended in there, but he really, you know, starting when he started with that very first horse that Cy Dawson had found, or they both had decided to buy, and I don't know financially who owned what, but he ended up with that horse after Cy died. Um, though that was the start of it all. One more thing. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the quarter horse name came because of their speed in the quarter mile. Quarter mile, right? yeah. Okay. And that 21. 21 second yeah that um yeah not if you're ever tempted to hear coke's voice i mean he talks about that race and that there were three watches and the slowest one was 21 seconds right <laughs> oh wow this is before any kind of digital thing so sure, sure. they looked it up you know and the the new record is 20.68 right you've got a whole lot of uh that was one dang fast horse. And it is 55 miles an hour. Wow. That that horse. From a dead stop, right? Yeah, from a dead stop. And, and the one thing that annoyed people um, with quarter horses was that they tended to kind of come out not really very fast. It, they're not like super fast out of, the, out of the gate. But when they see other horses ahead of them, like, I'm beating you, buddy. And they go <laughs> flying around in the middle. And then if they're ahead, they're like, okay, I better take it easy now. You know, I've got a little few more hundred feet to go here, not to worry, they're behind me. So it is like you know, her mentality is <laughs> driving everybody crazy, you know. Yeah. But what they like to do is chase and, and get, and that's fairly typical I, um, of a horse. They like to get in front. You know, it's like the people going up rabbit ears, right? right? <laughs> you're there. And all of a sudden, you know, you're like a target. And they just right. got to get around you. And then they're done. You know, then they get on their phone and eat lunch or something, right? It's true. It's true. Even on Highway 40. Even on Highway 40. Going to the mountain. Oh. <laughs> yeah. They just, they see you and they got to pass you. So just think Peter McHugh. <laughs> 
So I see. Is there still, do, do people still breed these quarter horses? Is, and they have a huge registry? Oh my there? gosh, yeah. 5.3 sure. million. Yeah. It's the biggest registry of horses in the world. Wow. It's based in Fort Worth, and that's where you'll find biographies of Peter McHugh and Old Fred and of Coke Roberts. They're in the Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. And yes, it's a very wealthy, big registry, and having a horse with papers is a big deal, Quarter Horses with papers. So. They're worth more you know, than a grade. The other word for an unregistered horse is grade. It's not mutt or, um, <laughs> yeah. what was that word that uh, Oldham used? Uh, a, a brush, a brush stallion that was an insult. Oh, you know, or for, yeah, when, uh, a, a horse that didn't have good breeding, you know, was, was or especially a stallion was really worrisome, right? Because they could get out and breed with a whole lot of mares and then you'd have a whole bunch of colts and then you'd have a whole bunch of this. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. I'm uh, happy to be the sub. Yeah, that was great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you.